joining us today for when old tech meets new tech using drones within the historic preservation space. I will introduce our presenter shortly, but wanted to cover a few basics first. My name is Janelle Kieser, and I'm the director of the Rocky Mountain Center for Preservation based in Leadville, Colorado. The Rocky Mountain Center for Preservation is an initiative of History Colorado, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that provides education around historic preservation and the hands-on preservation trades. This summer, our schedule of in-person workshops has been altered to fit into a digital format. These workshops are being offered at no cost, but if you're interested in contributing to our efforts, you can donate on our Colorado Give site at the website shown on your screen. In August, the center is offering an online three-part series called Living History in the Relevant Museum. This workshop will provide you a better understanding of how to incorporate living history programs at your site. All upcoming programs of the Rocky Mountain Center for Preservation can be found at our website, which is the first address, uh, web address on your screen. In our workshop today, we ask that you please mute your audio in order to prevent disruptions to the presentation. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll address those near the end of the session. Um, and just for your information, the session is being recorded and may be uploaded to the History Colorado YouTube channel at a later date. Uh, at this point, I will turn the session over to today's presenter, Jason Jeffries, a professional engineer with JBA Inc. and an FAA licensed drone pilot. He graciously agreed to adapt an in-person workshop so we were planning, that we were planning for this summer into this digital training, and I really appreciate his flexibility and willingness to do so. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, Jason, and let you take over. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Jeffries, as Gina just said. Uh, I work for JBA, a uh, structural and other uh, engineering consulting firm. And let me just pull up my presentation here. Oh, Janelle, you might have to allow me as a presenter. There we go. Okay. There we go. So again, my name is Jason Jeffries. I am a part one of seven certified pilot by the FAA, uh, also a professional engineer, lead accredited professional. Um, so quickly, I guess just a breakdown of, of what the presentation is going to be about today. Um, some of the history of preservation and, and forensics, the group history at, at JBA, uh, SUASs or drones, kind of go through what they are, what they look like. Uh, the one that I use in particular, uh, some of the FAA regulations and limitations on when you can fly, what you can fly, uh, what you can do while you're flying, things like that. The various uses of drones uh, in uh, any inspection or, or uh, evaluation type atmosphere, as well as some project examples. And I tried to leave plenty of time at the end for question and answers. Um, I, I told Chanel earlier, I, I could have done a presentation on drones or historic preservation and forensics, uh, probably for an hour each. Uh, but I, what I try to do is just kind of cover broad brush strokes uh, on each and then uh, leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So historic preservation and forensics at JBA, um, a lot of people don't understand why is historic preservation and forensics together? Well. Uh, we do work on old buildings, existing buildings. Uh, those can be more modern construction or obviously historic construction. Uh, there are typically issues with any buildings we deal with. Um, some are great examples like the Bosler House uh, there on the left. Uh, in the center, we have a large piece of sandstone that was coming off of a building in, in downtown Denver. Uh, we do what we call a pick and clean sometimes we'll go and look at, at stone or uh, brick buildings and, and look at for deterioration on uh, the exterior facade and then forensics more or less it could be a modern construction building this is at uh, uh, the stadium there at cu boulder uh, where we are looking at an expansion joint that's been leaking and things so uh, our team two of us uh, kind of focus primarily in the forensics section and then the other three are kind of in historic preservation but there is uh, an awful lot of, of overlap. So at JBA, we are a uh, Colorado-based engineering firm. Uh, we have offices in, in Boulder, Denver, Glenwood Springs, Fort Collins, and Winter Park. Uh, the home base is, is Boulder. Uh, the historic preservation and forensics team is built up with five members, um, three in Boulder and two in Denver. 
uh, like I said here, we, we have gone to a lot of school. Um, <laughs> uh, so at, at the bottom, you know, you can see with the five of us, we have over 65 years of combined experience and we are uh, engine nerds. Um, and I say that, you know, with, with a straight face and, and being completely serious, we are uh, engineers, engineers, and we love getting out there in the field, getting dirty and getting our hands on the materials and trying to understand, you know, what's going on with this building uh, and trying to figure out what we need to do to, to put it back to where it should be. Um, yeah. This is just some photos of us uh, in various states of uh, attire and PPE or uh, in flooded basements and things like that. So um, this is our probably our keynote project uh, as of late. It's the Mini Glacier Hotel at uh, Glacier National Park and we uh, did a seismic retrofit of the building and then some some other stabilization of uh, the main uh, fireplaces and, and things within the hotel. Um, and so we actually just won an, an award for it, uh, it within the Colorado Structural Engineering Association. This is just some more projects we have. On the left is uh, Goodnight Barn. It's located in near Pueblo, uh, Colorado. And it may look a little bit different to any of you that have been by it recently um, in the number of years, probably a handful of years in the past. There's been a giant wood frame at the front uh, just holding these masonry walls from uh, from top line over and and now the the structure uh, inside has been completely renovated and updated it's uh, tied all the walls back together and the exterior frame has been removed so it's uh, it's getting closer to be back to where it was at, at uh, its glory days on the right is the Sperry chalet uh, which had a, a fire uh, this is a very remote remote site um, i think people hiked it was a seven mile hike one way to get there. Uh, most of the materials were brought in by helicopter. Uh, all the workers that repaired this building uh, stayed in, in tents at the site and then shifted out every two weeks. It was, it was uh, quite a feat. So this is kind of where the uh, forensics and historic preservation kind of meet. <laughs> uh, on the left there's a building that is you know on the verge of collapse but uh, we want to Kind of maintain and, and stabilize that in its current form not put it back to you know as a new shape so on the right is kind of a, a snapshot of the interior where we put in some stabilizing cables and uh, some new uh, wooden framing members to to keep it stabilized and and not allow it to uh, collapse completely so old tech um, when you're looking at historic building materials you have a lot of things that uh, are, you know, new tech, old tech, middle tech. Uh, I think historic is technically anything over 50 years old. Uh, all of these materials are well over 50 years old. Uh, starting from the left, I think we'd start uh, with steel. That's probably the most modern material. Uh, here you can see a, a picture of some riveted together connections. Uh, next we have wood, uh, obviously with the stripes on the bottom of this particular uh, structure there's there was lap and plaster ceiling uh, that was installed um, then further to the center is is brick and with brick and stone I, I think we could probably go go either way so we can plop those back and forth if you if you like uh, but there's probably no denying that uh, a traditional adobe style brick uh, using the soil and, and grasses around uh, mixing that with water and, and making bricks to make a structure is it's probably the, the oldest of what I'm showing here anyway. Okay, so tools. We use a lot of tools uh, to go to sites and, and document things to try and diagnose what's going on, what needs to happen uh, with the building moving forward. Obviously a camera is a, is a great tool. Um, those have been around for a number of years. Uh, tape measure. Uh, my personal favorite is a stick rule, and if you can find the Lufkin branded version with the uh, little brass piece that, that slides out, that's the, that's the best one to get. Uh, a laser tape is a newer version of that, so um, I, my bag usually carries a 30-foot tape measure, a stick rule, and a laser tape, so uh, well prepared there. Flashlight uh, and all, just to poke around in some wood to see if there's uh, any rods or anything like that. A hammer, you can use this for 
retrieving your all if you've stuck it in too far, or you can uh, sound, excuse me, on some stone or, or concrete to uh, see if there's any delaminations uh, within the materials, and then also a notepad and, and something to write with. Um, so there's kind of a, you know, in general, you don't need the laser tape and everything else is pretty much old tech here. Um, so moving on, we can start going into some new tech. And this is just a collection of photos from uh, one manufacturer um, makes all of these drones. It's the same manufacturer that uh, I use uh, one of their drones. It's a DJI. It is a Chinese company. They are probably the top in the market for drones right now, consumer drones. Um, other companies make ones that are made just for, for cinema, but for here, uh, just quickly, on the upper left is a picture of what I would consider to be a, a toy drone. Um, it's less than $100. This one even looks like Iron Man. Um, so that's, that's great. <laughs> and then to its right, um, is the Mavic Mini is what they call it. This is uh, this is going to become important here in a second, but it weighs in at 249 grams. So if you can remember that number, uh, I'll explain more about that in a little bit. To its right, on the, the third one over is the Mavic Air 2. This is this one just came out, uh, I believe, a month and a half ago, maybe. Um, <clears throat> all these ones, these three on the uh, upper line all have foldable arms uh, so you can fold them down they pack away nice and neat into a case i'll show you that here in a minute uh, the one on the far right is a mavic 2 pro that's actually the drone that that i use and i'll show you here in a second on the lower uh, row the furthest left one is a phantom this is the phantom uh, 4 version 2. Um, they uh, this is probably the most recognizable drone of the consumer drone world. Uh, Phantoms have been around for a great number of years. Um, I say a great number. It's probably, let's say, seven years. <laughs> uh, in the center, uh, kind of looks the most sophisticated is the Inspire. Uh, the landing gear on this one with these arms actually moves up when it's time to fly, if you can imagine. Uh, and then you have a full 360 degree view with the camera. And for this particular drone, uh, there are opportunities where you can actually use two different remote controls. Uh, one, be the person operating the drone itself, and as a complete second person to do nothing but uh, operate the camera. So that'd be more used for um, kind of a cinema type atmosphere if you're shooting a commercial or something like that, where one person's going to fly, the other person's going to shoot the, the film or the SD card. Uh, and then on the right at the bottom here is a, a matrix, and this is the 600, it's a six bladed or six rotored copter. Um, and, and like I said, anything varying from <clears throat> the Iron Man at less than uh, $100 to about $400 to about $800 uh, to about uh, 15 or $1,600 to about 2,000. The Inspire in the center at the, at the bottom can range in price from 3,000 just for the drone itself with no camera to over 25,000 with a uh, specific camera and, and other sensors. And then the Matrice is more of a industrial type drone. So you can use that for, um, you know, looking at uh, crops and things like that. Uh, with uh, farming, or you can use it for uh, cameras and everything. This landing gear will move out of the way, but it starts at around 5,000 with no camera. And then you can add sensors from there. So let's see here. So what is an SUAS? Uh, it stands for Small Unmanned Aircraft System. And with that, the regulations start at anything that weighs more than 250 grams, and it's considered small if it weighs less than 55 pounds. So that's quite a range, um, and that's why that important number of 249 grams of the drone on the previous uh, page was so important. They, uh, the FAA requires a registration to be made of an aircraft 
of any time that it weighs <clears throat> 250 grams or more. So technically you could buy the Mavic Mini, it weighs 249 grams, you could fly that around and not have to worry about paying the $5 registration fee and registering it with the FAA if you were uh, concerned with that. Uh, you could do that as a hobbyist. Uh, you couldn't do that as a commercial pilot, you would still have to be licensed and you would still have to register it. But, uh, you know, drones and small aircraft have been around for uh, a great long time. Before multi-rotors were very popular, uh, people would strap helicopters uh, with cameras and fly those around doing the same thing. Um, so now it's just a little more stable pl platform than just a helicopter with a single rotor. Uh, the most common drone you'll see today is a, is a quadcopter. It's got four motors. Um, you can have six, you can have eight, you can have 10, 12. Um, you can have a number of, of motors. Uh, there's also fixed wing. Uh, those are really great for doing uh, large land areas of surveying for farmers' crops and things like that. They uh, are a lot more efficient. Uh, for flight than, than a quadcopter. So what do I use? Uh, I use the Mavic 2 Pro made by DJI. Um, it's got a Hasselblad camera on it. I don't know if everybody can see my uh, video, but um, let's see if I can. Anyway, uh, it's a little tiny case. Um, it's about the size of a purse that it can fit into. Uh, the drone will fold down into the size of a milk carton. Uh, so here, this, the front arms fold out, rear arms fold them around, and so that's kind of the size of the drone. And then uh, this is the controller. This is, uh, you just put your cell phone on the bottom and it connects via a wire, and then you have a, a full screen view on the controller of what the camera is seeing uh, while you're flying it. So uh, they call that uh, a bit of a first person view. So um, the only limitation really with this drone is, yeah, it's small, it's compact, you can bring it anywhere with you. Um, but you do have about 30-ish minutes uh, of flight time per battery. So I have three batteries. Uh, generally, I can say I can get safely about an hour of flight time out of those three batteries before those need to be recharged. So some of the FAA regulations, uh, limitations for the small unmanned aircraft systems. The top speed is 100 miles per hour. Uh, it's 87 knots. Um, none of these drones will go 100 miles an hour. Uh, Racing drones could, um, those are, are pretty small and they have very uh, punchy, powerful motors and uh, decent sized batteries. Um, a racing drone, I don't know if anybody has watched any of the drone racing league, but uh, in general, those flight times for those batteries are, are way, way lower than uh, what, what ours would be with, uh, with the Mavic 2 Pro at 31 minutes. Uh, a race drone might have to switch a battery every two minutes. Um, but they could easily uh, get to 100 miles per hour. Uh, the top altitude of 400 feet, and that's AGL, that's above ground level. So the interesting thing there is that uh, with all the airspace and everything else, if you are inspecting something that is pretty tall and pretty slender, um, say you're looking at a transmission tower, you can be, uh, if you're over the top of it, uh, you can be 400 feet over the top of it and still be in compliance with this 400 feet AGL, even if it's a thousand foot tall tower. So you're flying at 1400 feet, you are within your legal rights, according to the FAA. Uh, if you're within 400 feet of any particular object, be it a building uh, or anything like that, you're allowed to be 400 feet above that building roof uh, and still be in compliance with the FAA. You have to fly the, the drone with uh, visual line of sight, meaning that your un unaided eyes, uh, unless you have a prescription, that's fine, but not using binoculars. Uh, so you have to have an unaided view of the drone at all times when it's flying. Um, we're getting into days now where they're actually doing uh, beyond visual line of sight flights, and you have to get a, a waiver through the FAA in order to do that. Uh, you have to prove that you've 
you know, flown for a certain number of hours, you have a drone that is capable of uh, being controlled beyond this visual line of sight um, and all those sorts of things. Um, FAA does require you to stay 500 feet below and 2,000 feet horizontal from clouds. And this is always a tough thing of how are you supposed to gauge, you know, if you're 550 feet or 450 feet, that looks different when you're a thousand feet away from your drone. So um, anyhow, so yep, just need to be away from clouds and that's just to make sure that anything moving quickly as far as weather, um, you know, you need to, to stay away from those so you can keep your visual line of sight. Uh, it is prohibited to fly over people and uh, it is people that are not directly involved in the operation. So if there was a group of us, we were looking at a building <clears throat> and I was the pilot in command, um, it would be allowed for me to fly over the top of you all if you were observing because you are technically a part of the operation. But to fly just directly over people, like a crowd of people at a stadium or something like that is, is completely illegal. Um, and a lot of times there is a, uh, the FAA will actually put out a, um, a little memo uh, essentially that lets everybody know that uh, the airspace has, has been closed if there is an event such as a, a sporting event or other uh, large group of people, um, they'll put that out. And then you're limited to daylight operations and civil twilight. Civil twilight is 30 minutes before the sun comes up and 30 minutes after the sun goes down. Uh, and again, you can do just about anything you want with a waiver for the FAA. So you can get an FAA waiver to perform uh, flight during overnight or in the, in the nighttime hours uh, with no light. So, so drone uses, um, just go through some of these uses. And then a lot of these are just various uh, outputs that you get from the different softwares that you can buy for uh, a drone. So aerial photography or video, obviously that's uh, an easy one. Uh, photogrammetry, uh, that's kind of an old technology and uh, not a lot of people know about it, but essentially photogrammetry you could do with uh, a still, excuse me, a still camera on a tripod. And essentially what it does is you would have targets set up um, and you would know the distance or the size of those targets. And then you'd have those set around a room or a structure, uh, take a bunch of pictures uh, of those targets and make sure those targets are in every picture. And then at the end, you can upload those into uh, software and it can realign all of the images to give you essentially uh, a, a 3D uh, model or an ortho mosaic photo of whatever you're shooting. It doesn't have to be from a drone. So photogrammetry has been around for a long time. The drones just make it all that more simple because there's no keeping track of targets and everything because the drone software will actually go through, look at each photo, pick out kind of high contrasting points on its own, and then find those points in, in other photographs. So you don't have to do the painstaking work of matching all that up. Um, it does provide safe access to dangerous sites. In my, my previous job, um, I worked a lot in going in and looking at uh, you know buildings that are post-catastrophe whether it be earthquake or flood or fire or explosion uh, tornado you name it um, we would bring drones to sites and if we felt it wasn't safe to go in then we would send the drone in um, just because that's that's the easier more replaceable item is the drone than uh, obviously than uh, a person so uh, ortho mosaics. This is a collection of photographs that a drone software will put together using photogrammetry and the information uh, of the camera. And as far as where uh, the metadata for every picture includes the GPS coordinates, the elevation, all those sorts of things of where each picture was taken, uh, the angle of the camera, uh, all sorts of information. So we can put those together uh, they become geo-rectified in a geotef. Uh, you can download a, a KML file that you can put onto Google Earth uh, or an HTML file that you can use with Google Maps and overlay the two together. 
Uh, next would be a densified point cloud. So this is just a point cloud of all those points um, that are highly contrasted uh, within each um, photograph. And then the, the software actually puts together a, a point cloud. So it's essentially not a 3D model. It is a, it's a point cloud. So the, if you put a surface on the 3D on the point cloud, then you would have a 3D model. Uh, but anyway, it's just the points for this particular item. Uh, digital surface model. So this is getting to a 3D model, but this is mostly for uh, looking at um, plain things. So the ground, looking at uh, an ortho view of the ground. Uh, digital terrain model is the same thing, but it, it bring in, brings in the, the terrain features and kind of shows you the differences from one side to another as far as highs and low points. There's also thermal maps. Now that would require your drone to have a thermal camera. And there are, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of manufacturers that are uh, adding drone or adding thermal cameras to their drones these days, uh, even in the same size of drone that, that I have. Um, you can get a 3D textured mesh. So that's gonna be the point cloud with the mesh on top. You can get contour lines similar to that of a traditional survey, um, like a topo map. Uh, you can create those with any sort of uh, difference within each line. So whether it be a uh, one foot contour, a five foot contour, 10 foot. So there's lots of variation there. Uh, video animation, some people will fly a drone after a car accident and get as much information as they can about the intersection, the vehicles, where they landed, any of the skid marks, things like that, and then um, recreate that uh, digitally with that, that information. Then you can have 3D models. I put highly variable here because it is <laughs> higher, the results are highly variable. You can fly one battery and one flight around the building and get a 3D model. Uh, it's gonna be very crude. So the, the best way to do this is to make multiple, multiple flights, um, changing elevation, camera angle, all of these things, doing ortho photos, uh, nadir imagery from the sides, uh, and then combining all those together. Um, and that's, that's how you get the, the, the best looking uh, 3D model, most accurate. Crop analysis, there's the multi-spectral um, units that you can install on drones, and they can analyze crops for, you know, maybe where a farmer is, is not getting enough uh, watering done or there's a issue with some of the sprinklers or something like this you got acres and acres of, of land to cover so you can do a uh, pretty quick and easy crop analysis and um, so that's very handy for that and then surveying <clears throat> you can actually use a drone uh, similar to the one I have that has an additional antenna on it that is a, a RTK so it's a survey uh, station and they're, they're finding that uh, here as of late, that the distance, or sorry, not the distance, the accuracy of the survey is uh, rivaling that of walking around with a GIS station and actually doing a full on survey uh, by hand. So if you can think of that, and supposed to, you know, a survey crew being out there for potentially days or weeks on a very large site, um, somebody with a drone could fly that same site and maybe a day uh, and have the, the complete survey done in a much quicker time period. All right, so aerial photo video. This is an easy one. Uh, this is a silo out in Littleton, Colorado. Um, there were some issues up here. We were making sure uh, that this was going to be stable and it's a clay tile uh, silo. It was built in the 1930s and they're actually putting a roundabout around this in a, in a new development. So they wanted to understand whether this thing was, was gonna survive or not. Um, so it was you know, a lot of pictures from the bottom, but you couldn't really see what was going on here. And I don't know if anybody else would feel this way, but I was not gonna climb up this ladder on the side. Um, so we found out it's just a couple of boards that were laying across the top. Um, the silo was actually fairly round. The interior was in pretty good condition and uh, the drone was small enough that I actually flew it down uh, on the inside and got to take a bunch of photographs of the inside of the chimney or the, the silo as well. Um, 
which was something that you wouldn't have been able to do from the ground. Um, this is a picture of the Belvedere Theater in the center and the Shoe Fly Inn in uh, Central City, Colorado. Uh, we've been working on this project in particular for uh, a number of years. Um, they did add a new roof at some point, but nobody really wanted to climb out there on this particular day. So I was out there a day later, I think. I didn't have the drone with me that day, but came out a day or so later and took some pictures. So um, this is just much safer access. Here we did have a, a lift, but there was no way to get the lift up high enough and then the access onto the roof itself. Um, so if you're just gonna need some pictures of what the roof condition is like, uh, having a drone fly up there and take those pictures is a much better option. Similar situation here. This is <clears throat> the Trinidad, Trinidad Middle School, built in 1910. Uh, and they had a number of these chimneys and um, uh, outputs for, for airflow. So all the transom windows would go through the classrooms. Um, and out into the hallway and then in the hallway there'd be chutes going up to these chimneys so it was creating a natural draft but the condition of these uh, individual items was uh, kind of questioning questionable and uh, this this guy in particular is, is the picture that i've blown up here on the right and just understanding oops, my apologies uh the current condition of that and where some tuck pointing might need to occur and uh some of them are missing their capstones and, and things like that. So uh, good information to get, um, and we don't want to get up on this roof uh, to, to gather it. So uh, safe access in another aspect of things. This is the North London Mill. It's near Mosquito Pass, um, just outside of Alma, Colorado. And in this building in particular, it had already undergone a couple of partial collapses uh, some of the debris back here and then this roof over here uh, when our we had a team of engineers out there a little over a year ago <clears throat> looking at the structure and documenting uh, trying to find the load path to make sure that the roof was supported you know off the ground with the columns and uh, beams and everything um, some of it was uh, not supported correctly so the way we did this is I actually flew the drone in the building uh, and looked at the structure and documented things um, that we weren't comfortable going inside and, and taking a look at. So um, similar to after a fire or a partial building collapse, you know, this one's just <clears throat> as old and has, has uh, seen some better days, but uh, soon it will, it will be stabilized and, uh, and be back open for, for tourism. Um, these are kind of low res, but uh, this is, uh, the closest you can zoom in on uh, a Google Maps image, image, this is the big pool in Garden City, Kansas. And at one point it was labeled the largest hand dug uh, body of treated water in North America. <laughs> um, it's well over a football field in size and uh, it's, it's getting renovated. But uh, this this is the Google Maps on the left, and this is uh, part of the ortho, ortho mosaic that my uh, my drone flight created. So you can see there's some additional sidewalk and some additional buildings in the uh, ortho that are not in uh, the original photo from from Google Maps. So occasionally you can get some better updated uh, aerial photography of of a site just from going out and, and flying for a few minutes to, to gather that data. <clears throat> this is uh, not necessarily historic, but it is something that could be used in a historic realm. Um, this is a wastewater treatment plant uh, in West Jefferson County uh, over near Evergreen. And they had a bunch of utility locates done and they uh, got really tired of having to uh, have the utility companies come out and remark these. So these are a couple of images that the drone took during its flight. And then this is the whole path uh, with all the utility locates on, on each, um, each different color as far as the uh, utilities, as far as sewer or gas or communications power. So now they have this and they can zoom in and out and, and figure out where things are. This below is a digital terrain model uh, of the same ortho mosaic. So essentially, 
dark blue is low in elevation, uh, dark red is high in elevation. So you can see this is a dome and, and that's kind of just represented here. So this is the same information. The drone software just pops it out at the same time. Um, so it's, it's very, very useful at some point. So I had a densified point cloud here. And I think if I do this, so this is of um, a treatment plant. And again, we have environmental engineers, so they loved having me go out and fly things. <laughs> so uh, I apologize that I don't have a big model of a very large historic site, mostly because generally they have a lot more trees and it's harder to do. Uh, but with a treatment plant, it's pretty wide open. But again, this is uh, a 3D model created of, you know, just one flight with, with the drone. Um, I didn't have any angled uh, photography here, so that's why the buildings look a little different. But uh, so this is the 3D point cloud that could be uh, eventually changed into a 3D model. Hey, Jason, it's so, Janelle. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm seeing the densified point, densified point cloud with the North London Mill photos. Okay, let me see if I can share this other. Okay, let me know if it updates. Uh, yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so this is the densified point cloud that was created uh, off of one flight of a treatment plant. And again, this is just ortho photos. So the camera was aiming completely straight down the entire time. That's why there's gaps uh, in this in particular. But so this is what a, a point cloud would look like. And as you can see, it's just a bunch of points made up um, that the software picks out of every photograph. Um, so it's not necessarily a, a mesh or um, a surface model, but it is just a, a point cloud of, of um, numerous, numerous points that uh, the software is, is picking out. So let me go back here. Okay. So with that, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to end with. Um, we've got about 20 minutes. I've got some other, uh, you know, just for uh, grins, other photographs of things on um, historic preservation projects that we've worked on in the past um, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. This is Cheese and Park Fountains and here in Denver. Um, this is kind of getting into more of the uh, forensic side of things, taking out cores of the concrete to see what's going on and, and you know, why, why is this damage and this spalling occurring. Um, again, this is the, the Sperry Lodge. Uh, this is what it looks like now. It's uh, getting a new roof and everything after, after the fire. Um, this is one of the guests. <laughs> no, this is, uh, this is some of our team here uh, on site after the fire putting in the stabilization and, and uh, really getting hands on with the stonework and, and seeing what damage was done by the fire. And again, just the mini glacier. This is the interior of the hotel. This is some of the um, seismic retrofitting that was completed um, to, to get that back open. And then Actually, most of these columns were actually replaced. Uh, the wood was put back on the outside, but inside there are actual steel columns uh, for uh, seismic purposes. Um, this is just at Harris Street, some really great uh, scissor trusses here in the roof. And probably one of the older historic, uh, historic preservation uh, projects that JBA completed was in Redstone uh, at these Coke ovens. So here's a historic picture on the right at the bottom and then the, the group of us uh, trying to emulate that same photo. So with that, I'll go back to my closing page. Oops. <clears throat> so if anybody has uh, questions they want to ask now, that's great. Um, if you want to wait and just send them to my email, it's uh, jjefferies at jbajba.com. And outside of that, I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Jason, this is Janelle. Um, mm -hmm. just a quick question about, can you tell us more about how you got involved in using drones and some of the training and the licensure required for that? Sure, sure. So uh, as far as drones, you know, I was always 
kind of into um, radio controlled cars and, and things like that as a kid. Uh, and then growing up and thinking of, you know, new uses of things and how do I, how do I do these other things um, that, that maybe, you know, the, the tough access. And my previous company actually had a couple of guys in the, uh, their Manhattan office in New York that were starting to use drones. And so um, me at the time I was living in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, asked the office manager there, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing all this work for uh, insurance losses and some of them are, are pretty dangerous and we really can't get enough information out of you know, the ground photos or what we can see without being inside the building or looking at the roof, uh, things like that. So I really just kind of uh, asked um, and said, hey, there's these, these drones out there. They have amazing cameras on them. They can take pictures, video, all these other things. They can do it, you know, 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Um, and we don't have to go in there. We don't have to rent a lift, which is generally thousands of dollars. Um, we don't have to make sure that we have the right fall protection gear or put any of our, uh, our employees at risk. And, and they were really uh, amicable to that and, and jumped on board. And, and so, uh, again, this goes back to the engineer. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've always been interested in, in you know, tech and, and gear and things like that. And, so uh, drones was just kind of the next step for me. Uh, as far as training, um, so I, I am a licensed pilot, as I've, I've mentioned a couple times, I think. Um, the training involved, I, I signed up for a course. Uh, it's called Drone Pilot Ground School. Um, and that course was, um, you know, just for costing, I think it was in the neighborhood of $300. Uh, it's all video-based, but it gives you a complete transcript of every video. Uh, you go through and, and essentially things changed um, up in, up in uh, let's see, August of 2016. So before August of 2016, if you wanted to be a drone pilot per the FAA, you needed a pilot's license. So you needed a, a license to pilot a manned aircraft um, and then get a waiver in order to fly um, just these little drones, which is uh, kind of crazy. But in 2016, they came out with the Part 107. Um, and so now it's, it's a little more simple than that. You do still have to learn uh, how to read a, uh, an air uh, map um, with all the various airport in, in information on there, as well as uh, military and other training routes. Um, you need to know about how to read the elevation of certain items, what items are on, on these maps. So there is a lot more information that's required. Um, and that information is required only because you have to take an exam in order to, to become licensed. And, and there are questions regarding weather and uh, aeronautics of the aircraft itself and how it performs in high altitude and uh, hot air versus low altitude and cold, you know, damp air. Um, so there is quite a bit of knowledge you have to to kind of get in there, which you wouldn't really think would apply to a drone. In the end, you know, it does. Um, a little different than an aircraft where the airfoil of, of the wing is actually providing the lift. You know, here we have the, the props that are, that are providing the lift, right? So, but it's, it's very similar. Um, anybody that's interested, I would highly recommend the Drone Pilot Ground School. Um, and if you have a, a questions about that, feel free to shoot me an email. I can, I can send you the link to the page. Um, like I said, that is um, a $300 course. And then taking the exam is, is $150. And you do have to take a, a renewal every two years. So, uh, Thanks for that. We have a question from Sarah. And her question is, uh, is there an ideal time of day for when it's best to use drones? And also, what about weather? Yeah, so I'll talk about the weather one first. Um, weather is always questionable. If it's uh, going to be windy, um, you know, the, the small drones like the, the Mavic Mini that's, that's 249 grams, um, that one it could literally fit in your pocket. Um, if it's, if it's going to be windy at all, you, you don't want to fly that. It's, it's also not, I should have said this earlier, that drone in particular uses uh, cameras for stabilization, whereas uh, the Mavic Air and above all use uh, GPS. So anytime I'm, I'm flying a drone, uh, my drone, 
it it's locked on to anywhere between 10 and I think I've seen it as high as 17 or 18 GPS satellites. So these things are remarkable um, as far as the stabilization. Uh, wind, uh, I've had mine flying in 20 to 25 mile per hour gusts and it doesn't even blink an eye. Um, the stabilization is really that great. It uses, I think it has <laughs> something like 10 cameras on it um, and a lot of those are used for positioning. Um, but the, if you're outside, then it uses the, the GPS satellite signals. Um, the cameras can be used on when you're flying around inside and maybe you don't have the GPS signal on the inside. Uh, but it will tell you when you're flying close to a wall, it will tell you when you're uh, about to hit something. Um, most times it will actually stop and not allow you to fly any further uh, if it knows you're gonna run into something. Um, as far as the time of day, uh, it really kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for, you know, just a really uh, beautiful shot of, uh, you know, a building or something like that, uh, that can be either eastern exposed or western exposed, then you'd want to try to get that either very early in the morning or very late in the evening, uh, right as that kind of golden hour. Um, when the sun is first coming up and the sun is going down. Uh, if you're looking to get photos of the ground, obviously, um, you know, noon is, is a good time for that. Uh, but really the, the lighting around noon is, is not good if you wanna get some sort of, uh, you know, really beautiful shot of, of a building because the light can be pretty harsh at that point. Uh, so really you can, you can go about any type time of day, but uh, <clears throat> in general, you know, early morning or uh, later in the evening is, is better for those kind of uh, dramatic shots. Uh, middle of the day is good for uh, shots where you're creating 3D models and things like that where uh, really harsh shadows might, might uh, be a detriment to the end result. Um, Jason, this is Janelle again, and I had a question related to batteries and drones. I'm imagining that you have to take several batter charged batteries with you when you're going out for the day. Is the quality of battery, um, is that improving or are they really heavy? Like what makes it such a challenge for the battery aspect of things? Yeah, so um, this drone, you know, the battery is, and I don't know, Janelle, can you see um, me holding these things up? Uh, no, you are still sharing your screen, so we see okay. your email screen. There you go. Yeah. So um, this is the battery here. And I guess maybe you guys couldn't have seen the drone earlier then. Um, this is uh, the drone that I fly and it, it folds up, you know, into this uh, contraption about the size of a half gallon milk carton. So this is, this is the drone here. Um, it fits into this case. And in this case, I can carry the drone, the controller, two extra batteries, a uh, charger, and everything else I might need. Um, this is the controller. And again, this is just my, uh, my cell phone here. And then it connects via wire uh, to the cell phone. But then this becomes the screen and it shows you what the camera is seeing uh, on the drone while you're flying. Um, and that is, uh, a 720 resolution uh, image and you can actually see what the drone is seeing for you know even if it's flying miles away from you so it's it's a pretty robust system there um, the battery technology is getting better um, I want to say the first phantom drone I had maybe flew 15 minutes and that was about five years ago um, so for five years to get you know, double the battery life. Uh, to me, I think that's pretty good. They're all um, lithium ion batteries. Um, so it's, it's, you all have to take the same precautions. If you're gonna fly with it, you know, on a plane, you wanna have the batteries with you in the cabin and not <clears throat> in the luggage compartment, just in the event that it would, uh, would could spark and, and catch fire. Any other questions from our, our participants today?
Well, it looks like that answered most of our questions. Thank you so much, Jason. And I am going to share my screen one more time, uh, just so you guys can see uh, my contact information. And uh, also, if you're looking for information about our workshops, the website's at the very top. If you would like to give a donation um, on behalf for this workshop, then you can use our Colorado Gives uh, website. And again, these are free. We're just doing these because we want to get the information out and provide some digital content for folks at a time when we would really like to be doing the in-person, but we just can't do that right now. Um, and of course, my email and contact information at the bottom if you have any questions or maybe even suggestions.